Take your Bibles, please. Turn with me over to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. Just a quick reminder after the service tonight. Don't run off. We've got a few minutes of a business meeting. It won't take long. Um, and um, those of you that are members of our church and you are watching the service online, um, heads up, the business meeting will not be online. However, the paperwork that we pass out at the end of the business meeting, like we always do, is available. If you would like a copy, if you will, shoot us an email or call the office tomorrow. We'll make sure you get a copy of that if you would like to have it. But um, that'll be right after the close of the service tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Will you stand with me, please? This is one of the messages the Lord gave me yesterday in uh, my studying and just trying to find God's will. Normally my Saturday routine is I set up my laptop and my Bible at the dining room table and I'm pretty much there most of the day. I get up from time to time, stretch my legs, but I'm usually there all day on Saturday getting ready for Sunday. And um, as I said this morning, the Lord gave me several uh, new messages yesterday. This is one of them. And I hope that the Lord will challenge and strengthen and encourage your heart from this message tonight. We're going to look at one word and build a message around a word that the Apostle Paul uses four times in chapter 1 and chapter number 2. For the sake of time, I won't read all the verses, uh, but I will read the four verses and give you the title and then let you be seated. Look with me, if you would, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Verse 16, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. Chapter 2, verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Did you catch the common word? I'm preaching tonight on this thought, I'm not ashamed. Amen, I'm not ashamed. Lord, help us tonight as we open the scriptures. I pray that you would help us to be able to be a blessing an encouragement to your people. We thank you, Lord, for the service this morning. But Lord, we need you to speak to us again tonight. We ask you to do that, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. We, let, me, let me begin by saying tonight, we live in a society where shame is a rare thing. In fact, some people are completely unable to blush. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 15 says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. It goes without saying that some things we should be embarrassed about. God gave us as human beings the ability to get embarrassed. <laughs> Come on now. But we live in a society where nothing's wrong. I've heard women talking in the Walmart in language that made me blush. It didn't make them blush, but it embarrassed me. I remember we used to say cuss like a sailor. Now you just cuss. I've never heard people talk the way they talk. Women. I almost said ladies. I almost messed up and said ladies. Women cussing in front of their children. Kids cussing in front of their parents. Shocking, shocking, shocking. And I just, I'm not even going to get started on all that. That's not what I want to preach about. I just had to go there, didn't I? Ezra spoke for the entire nation in Ezra chapter 9, verse number 6. He said, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses grown up into the heavens. It's a good thing when you can blush. It's a good thing when you have the capacity to be ashamed and be embarrassed. That's a good thing. People who's had their conscience seared with a hot iron 
People who don't have the ability to, to blush or be ashamed, they're, they're in serious spiritual conditions, all right? Paul said it in one place, I think it was Ephesians 4, he said their past feeling, talking about their lasciviousness, their past feeling, they've gotten numb, they've gotten desensitized to their sin and they're not even able to blush. Uh, I tell you, we've come a long way from when I was a kid, things that people would have never dreamed of doing when I was a kid, they do it now and don't think twice about it. Say things and do things. It's just, and, and I grew up, we grew up strict, and I grew up with, with rules and guidelines, and there was, uh, there was things that was just, it was proper and it was improper. The older generation's nodding their head. They understand what I'm talking about. I remember when the I remember back in the day when it was it was it was offensive to even use the word pregnant. Right. I remember when that wasn't even a word. You said they were in the motherly way or they were expecting. Right. And uh, man, and, and that that now that's nothing compared to what people do say and do. It's unbelievable. And I'm I mean I'm a I'm a grown man. But there's times that people say stuff it embarrasses me. I'm ashamed. I wish I somewhere I wish I somewhere else. Say, preacher, what's your problem? I don't know. Maybe I just got some scruples, some 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 morals. Maybe I've maybe I've just been trained better, I've been taught better, as many of you have. However, there are times when we should not be ashamed. That's what I want to focus on tonight. Just like there's times when we ought to be ashamed. I remember growing up, my parents looked at me and said, "You ought to be ashamed of yourself." And if I wasn't, after they said that, I was. Huh? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And then I then I was embarrassed because I wasn't embarrassed. Huh? Yeah. See, we live in such a society today where it's wrong to make anybody feel bad for anything. Right. They can do whatever they want to do. You know, they can burn police cars if they want to. Just don't make them feel bad for it, right? But but uh, just like there are times when we should be ashamed, there are times when we should not be ashamed. Several times in this passage of scripture, the apostle Paul listed several things that we should not be ashamed about, shouldn't be ashamed for. And I'm going to give you three simple points tonight using these verses that we just read. Number one, write this down. I'm not ashamed of the testimony of the Savior. Look at what he says in verse number eight. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Well, what a statement. What a statement. Paul is admonishing Timothy not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. By the way, Paul had every right to preach this because Paul had a testimony according to Romans chapter number one, verse number 16. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The apostle Paul had a testimony of boldness when it came to the gospel and the testimony of Christ. And so now as he's training and mentoring this young pastor Timothy, he said, whatever you do, don't find yourself being in a position where you're ashamed of the testimony of Christ. Don't do that. I used to have a 1980... Ford Courier pickup truck. I got married in 90, we got married in 95, and this truck was 15 years old, but it looked 200 years old. I bought it from my father in law for $500, biggest piece of garbage I ever had in my life. I'm talking about a hunk of junk. I lost track of how many times on the side of the road I had to rebuild the carburetor just to get home. I lost track of how many cans of that quick start I had to spray into that thing to get that truck to crank. I remember the time we got caught, I got caught coming home from work in a rainstorm coming down I-20, coming from uh, Edenton, Georgia, going towards Atlanta, Brother Sasser. I mean, it was raining cats and dogs. I know it was raining cats and dogs because I stepped in a poodle. <laughs> I had to take a rope. <laughs> Running out the window. Come on, Brother Snipes. That was a good joke right there, man. He groans before I even tell the punchline. Run the rope out the window, hook it to my windshield wiper, and I'm driving down the road, and I'm doing my windshield wiper because it only worked one way, which that's not how it's supposed to work. And you're driving. 
And that's all it wants to do. So you have to pull it and then to go back by itself. And that's how I, I drove home like this. <laughs> Felt like the Beverly Hillbillies going down the road. The seat cushions was ripped. The, the paint was dead, the oxidized, the rims were rusted, the tires were bald. The only thing I liked about that truck was a bumper sticker that I had put right on that back windshield. It said, real men love Jesus. Yeah. Had to do something to toughen up that piece of junk. <laughs> I'd ride around with my head up in the air. Real men love Jesus, praise God. They drive junk, but they love the Lord. <laughs> I'll never forget, my father-in-law sold me that truck. He didn't want to sell it to me. I wanted a truck. He didn't want to sell it to me because I was, he's a Ford man. I'm a Chevy man. And we went back and forth with one another all the time about the Chevys and the Fords. He said, I, he said it won't work for you driving that Ford. I said, I need a truck to get it to work. He said, it won't work for you. I said, just sell me the truck. I had to beg him to sell it to me. <sighs> Biggest piece of junk I ever bought in my life. <laughs> he was, he come to see us one day. He come to see us one day, and we got to talk about that truck. I said, I can't believe you sold me that truck. He said, you said you wanted that truck. I said, you should have told me I didn't. <laughs> he said, I'll buy it from you right now. I said, I can't sell it to you. I can't even get the stupid thing to crank. He said, I'll buy it from you right now. I said, how much you give me? He said, how much did you pay for it? I said, I paid $500. He said, I'll give you $500 back right now. I said, you're crazy. It won't even crank. I said, I've gone out there and tried my best to crank it. I can't get the carburetor. I ain't lying. I couldn't get the carburetor to stay on it long enough for it to crank. It'd just vibrate off. I'm not making this up. He said, I'll give you $500 for it right now. I said, well, I'll, I'll sell it to you, but you're not getting any kind of a money-back guarantee, no kind of warranty. When you walk out that door, it's yours. I'll have you know he handed me five $100 bills, went and got in that truck, cranked it, and drove it an hour and a half home. Didn't have a minute's trouble out of it. <laughs> but the one thing I liked about that truck was that bumper sticker. Real men love Jesus. And I'd pull up on a construction site. You know, anybody with any decency about them would have been ashamed of that truck, but I pulled up there and back it up where everybody had to look at that bumper sticker all day on my back window of that truck. Boy, I love watching them construction guys cringe. You get out singing, I trust and obey. Ain't God good. Boy, it's a beautiful day. Ain't God good. Boy, hey, man, boy, I'm glad to go to work today. Ain't God good. Them big old rough, surly construction workers, you see them get nervous. What was Paul telling Timothy? Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Jesus was crystal clear in Mark chapter number 8 and verse number 38. Here's what Jesus said. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What a statement. Here's what Jesus said, and I know you understood perfectly what he said because it's plain English, but let me break it down for you. Here's what Jesus said. If you can live in an adulterous and wicked society and be ashamed of Jesus, you've got problems. If you can live in a world that's full of immorality and filth and ungodliness and wickedness and you're more embarrassed by Jesus Christ and the word of the scripture than you are the world you live in, Mark it down. I'm going to be ashamed of you when you stand before me one day. That's, that's, that's cutting it pretty tight. There's going to be people that's not ashamed of this world. I mean, they're so used to it, they never change the channel for anything. Come on now, it's fixing to get tied up in here. I feel it. I feel it just getting tight. I don't even preach against TV no more. Y'all couldn't handle it if I did. But we don't have one. I, don't, I can't have it. And every now and then we'll go in a motel and we'll turn the TV on and I'm reminded all over again why we don't have a TV. You, can't take, you cannot set the remote control down. I mean, you've got to be Johnny, you gotta be, you gotta be Johnny on the spot with that, changing that channel for just the commercials. It's ungodly. It's wicked. Even the Hallmark channel anymore. All this homosexuality, they're shoving out everybody's throat. Same-sex marriages at Hallmark. 
I ain't watching that mess. I don't want my kids looking at that mess. But we got people, they, won't even, they, won't, they don't even know where the channel's at. They don't know where the remote's at. And I mean, it's just playing, and cussing, and profanity, and God's name in vain, and bed scenes, and all kinds of garbage. And they don't ever think about changing the channel, but they're too embarrassed to pass out a gospel track. You got problems, friend. There's going to be a day when you stand before God and God's going to have to put his head down and say, I don't know whether or not to claim you. You got saved and your name's in the book of life, but I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to see you this evening. That's what he said he's going to do. Is everybody still with me? He said, if you live in an adulterous and wicked generation and be ashamed of me and of my words, he said, mark it down. The day's coming when I'll be ashamed of you. That's what Jesus said. Mark 8, 38, in case you didn't get that reference. In case you think I'm up here making this up. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. If you can put up with all this nonsense and never look down, never bat an eye, and then somebody around you starts talking about the Lord and you want to go stand somewhere else, he said, I'm going to be ashamed of you one day because you're ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Imagine being ashamed of Jesus. By the way, Romans chapter number 10 is a great verse, verse number 11. Whenever I lead somebody to Christ, I use a lot of times all kinds of different roads. I use different paths and roads, different verses, depending on their background. But one of the most familiar ways to lead somebody to Christ is through the book of Romans. We call it the Romans Road. There's been a lot of people got saved going down that Romans Road. I marked it in my Bible years ago, Romans 3.23. Right on down through there, all the way. But I never do the Romans road. I never lead somebody to Christ through the book of Romans. But what I don't end up at Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 11. He said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And I'm going to tell you something. This is just me. But one real good indication that somebody really got saved is when they're not ashamed to tell somebody. I'm going to tell you something. When you get saved... But you're embarrassed to tell people? I put a big old question mark over it. You might have got saved. You might have got saved. You might be as saved as Apostle Paul. But the Bible says that if you're saved, you won't be ashamed of it. Why would a person that was going to hell and now they're going to heaven be ashamed of the one that's taking them there? Why would a person drowning in the sea of sin be ashamed of the one that threw them the life preserver? Why would a person that was dead and trespasses and sin be ashamed of the one that quickened them and brought them to life and raised them from the dead spiritually? Why would a person that was blind be ashamed of the one that gave them sight? Why would a person that was in bondage and a slave to sin be ashamed of the one that set them free and broke the shackles and gave them a new loving taskmaster? Why? Explain to me you'd be ashamed of that man named Jesus. If you're not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, then you won't be ashamed to talk about him. You can find out what people like, what they're thinking about by what they talk about. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaketh. That's what it says. Hang around somebody long enough, you find out what they're thinking about. When's the, when's the last time you talked about the Lord around unbelievers? Or are you a chameleon? You just blend in with whoever you're with. If you're with lost people, you can tell dirty jokes and laugh and make fun of stuff. And, and then when you're around Christians, you, you, you tighten it up and clean it up and talk a different language. Come on now. We got a bunch of bipolar Christians. It's off their meds. Schizophrenic. They can't figure out where they're at. Just kind of let their crowd. I didn't plan on saying all this. If you're not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, you won't be embarrassed to walk with him. I have a problem with these teenagers when they go through the stage where they don't want to be seen with their parents. I hope you live long enough to have teenagers. See what that feels like. Bring somebody into the world. Change your diaper. Yeah. Wipe up their puke. Come on now. Help. 
bathe them and put them in the bed every night. And then about 15 years of that, and they don't want nobody to know that right. you're their parents. Exactly right. You're their kid, and they're your parents. If we want your mom and dad to drop you off a block from the school so that your friends don't have to see the vehicle your parents drive. And they're driving a piece of junk because they're making sacrifices to put you in Christian school. <laughs> so, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying, I know some people that's ashamed of the Father. They don't want anybody to know that God's their Father. That's pretty messed up when you think about You don't want nobody to know that the creator of the universe is your Father. Come on now. Come on now. You don't want, to, you don't want nobody to know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If you're ashamed of him, if you're not ashamed of him, you won't be embarrassed to act like him. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's quiet. It's a quiet. It's a quiet here now. You can hear a cough drop. I'm looking for Stuart. Where's Stuart? Come here, Stuart. Come here. Hurry up. Hurry up. We stand at the back of the church while I go talking to Brother Arthur and his wife, and Stuart walked up there. Come here. Stand over here beside me. I stood there and looked at Brother Arthur and his wife. I said, is there any way that I could ever not claim him? <laughs> huh? I mean, the fact that he's tall, I hate that about him. <laughs> I don't know where he got that from because I'm taller than his mama, but he's taller than all of us. Just sit down. Looks like his daddy, don't he? He's a good-looking devil, ain't he? <laughs> you know what's amazing to me? It's amazing to me. We don't want nobody to know that we're related to God. When we find ourselves ashamed of the testimony, you say, I'd never do that. That's exactly what Simon Peter said. About 10 minutes before he had a cussing fit and did exactly that. They said, you're, 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 you're with him. He said, no, I'm not. You're one of his. No, I'm not. Your speech betrays you. He said, well, I can fix that. And he started cussing. Yeah. Trying to throw him off. I know not the man. You just told him just a minute ago that you'd go with him even unto death. So don't, don't say tonight that you hadn't and you wouldn't. Peter did. We could. Be ashamed of the testimony of the Savior. If you're not ashamed, you won't be embarrassed to tell other people about him. You know, I've been passing out gospel tracts my whole life. I've been knocking on doors since I was tall enough to reach a doorbell. And I still sometimes get a knot in my stomach. So women. Please don't hang me out to dry. Anybody else in here get nervous besides me? And right, you, you, you've got the idea, I'm going to give that person a track. And right before you go to give it to them, all of a sudden you're like, oh man, yeah, on. what are they going to say? Uh-huh. What are they going to do? I don't know. Give it to them and find out. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, in this adulterous and wicked generation, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father and before the, the angels. I don't want to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Number two, look at what he says in verse eight. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Look at what he says in verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed to suffer. Now, I don't want you to be ashamed of me because I'm suffering. In fact, I want you to go on ahead and jump in here with me. Write this down, number two. I'm not ashamed of the tribulation of the saints. Paul said, don't be ashamed of me. I'm a prisoner. I'm in prison. I'm in chains. I'm in bonds for preaching. I'm in jail. I'm in prison for fulfilling the call of God in my life. I don't want you to ever find yourself in a place where you're apologizing for me because you know me. Timothy, wasn't you you working, laboring with Paul? Yeah, that's right. Isn't he in prison? Uh, Yeah, well, you know, 
He's just got a different way of doing things. I'm not saying that's what he did. I'm saying that's what Paul's telling him not to do. Don't you be ashamed of me. I love to have a dollar for every person that has apologized for me when I didn't want them to. Don't apologize for me if I ain't sorry. You just got to overlook our pastor. You know, sometimes he says things. I don't want you to overlook me. I don't put a microphone on and stand up here and live stream for people to overlook me. I want you to hear every word I'm saying. Amen. That's right. Paul said, I'm in prison for being a, a preacher of the gospel and I don't want nobody to intimidate you or embarrass you because of that. Right. Don't be ashamed of the tribulation that's associated with being a Christian. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to be diplomatic. And I know there's a time for diplomacy. There's also a time for just straightforward, straight down the line, plain talk. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't remember who said it, but years ago I heard it as a boy and it stuck in my mind and I thought about it a million times. Somebody said, one preacher said, silence is golden, but sometimes it's just plain yellow. Paul said, I could have not said anything, and I'd be on the outside. But I did what God told me to do, and now I'm in, I'm in jail. Look at what he said about Onesiphorus in verse 16. He oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. <laughs> In fact, verse 17, when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. Found him in jail. Found him in jail, in a, in a, in a prison, in a Roman, stay with me now, Onesiphorus found Paul in a prison cell in Rome. Stayed on it. He put on his Sherlock Holmes outfit and he found him. Stayed with him until he found him. They didn't have computers and probably didn't have the technology back then to keep track of prisoners like they do now. Right. I imagine that was an ordeal for Onesiphorus to find Paul, but he found him. And when he found him, you know what he didn't say? Paul, I'm so sorry to see you in here. Paul, I'm so sorry. You're in jail. I'm, I, I just, I hate so bad. <laughs> the reason why I know that is not what he said because Paul said he off refreshed me. That's right. And that's not what a preacher in jail wants to hear. <laughs> a preacher in jail for preaching wants to hear somebody when they find him say, there, praise God, there you are. How's it going, Brother Paul? Are you been able to witness have you been able to tell people about the Lord? How you, how you, is everything going all right in here? Won't you know we're so proud of you? We're praying for you. We, everybody we bump into, we say, you know, Paul, that's my buddy down there in the jailhouse. Come on now. Come on now. I got so tickled back last year, but I was like, preacher, you go to jail. We're going to be praying for you. I said, no, you better go with me. How many times? Look how many times in the book of 2 Timothy alone, just this one book, it's only got four chapters in it. Look how many times Paul referred to suffering. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. We just read it, verse 8, verse 12, and verse 16. In all three of those verses, he talked about not being ashamed. Look at chapter 2, verse number 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. Look at verse 12. If we suffer shall also reign with him. Look at what he says in chapter number uh, 3, verse number 10. Look at what he says. That I have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at what he said in chapter 4, verse number 5. Watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Huh? 
Look at verse 6. He's talking about his pending martyr's death, by the way. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid for me a crown of righteousness. He's talking about he knows he's about to die. He knows he's going to be martyred. Brother Bittner, not only have I always marveled at the fact that he knew he was going to be martyred, but the Holy Ghost gave him a heads up, let him know what crown he was going to win. There's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. God's already given me a behind the veil glimpse. I know what's waiting on me. <laughs> Look at chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. We're talking about tribulations and sufferings and persecution. We don't know what Alexander the coppersmith did to Paul. He didn't say. He just said he did me much evil. And for anybody out there that gets offended when preachers name names, Paul named names. He said, Alexander, and in case there was more than one, it's the coppersmith. Did me much evil. Well, Paul sounds to me like you got a little bitterness problem. Paul says, I'm not bitter. I'm just warning you, verse number 15, you better watch out for him. He'll do it to you too. <laughs> of whom be thou aware? For he hath greatly withstood our words. Uh, Timothy, if you bump into a coppersmith named Alexander, put your hard hat on, it's going to get real. Just telling you, me and him's done tangled a time or two. He didn't mean much evil. What are we talking about? We're talking about tribulation, suffering, persecutions. Look at verse number seven. Uh, uh, look at verse number sixteen. Right at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Verse seventeen. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. He said, "I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion." Look at verse eighteen. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me in His heavenly kingdom. Look how many times in this one book the Apostle Paul referred to affliction, suffering, persecution. And you know what he said to Timothy at the beginning of the letter? Don't be embarrassed and ashamed for me being, being uh, suffering. In fact, I want you to go ahead and be a partaker. Go ahead and get it in your mind that this is going to be how it is for you too. See, we got a lot of people that says, I want to be a Christian. I'm going I'm to serve the Lord. I'm going to go with God. And then they start dealing with some pushback from their family or from their friends, or on the job, and all of a sudden they're like, I don't know, I didn't buy into all this. I put this in my notes. I honestly think if we're going to call ourselves Christians in 2021, we're going to have to understand suffering has always been a part of being a Christian, and it's about to get even more real. Yes, sir. You're right there. And if you're easily embarrassed, if you're thin-skinned, if you're a snowflake, you ain't going to make it. If somebody laughing at you is all it takes to deter you, you're not going to make it. Preacher, I, I'm fine till they start laughing at me. Is that all it takes, laughing at you? Because there was a group of Christians back in the day that went all the way and got burned at the stake. They got fed to the lions. They got sawn in half. And we can't handle somebody laughing at us. We're embarrassed to pray over our food at the restaurant. Afraid somebody's going to snicker. Talking about I'm not ashamed of the tribulation of the saints. By the way, by the time you get to the book of Acts, suffering so much a part of the plan of God, he just went ahead and told them from day one, expect it. In fact, when he saved, he saved Saul on the road to Damascus and told Ananias, he said, I want you to go over and find him. And Ananias, after three days, finally hooked up with Paul whose name was still Saul at that time. Here's what Ananias said to Saul. You ready? New convert. I'm going to handle them with kid gloves. They just got saved. I don't want to scare them off. Here's what Ananias, Ananias said to Saul. You ready? He said, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Welcome to the Christian family, brother, brother Saul. Are you ready to suffer? Are you ready? Because that's what God saved you for. He saved you to suffer. Great things for his name's sake. And all you've got to do is go over to 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 12, and read down through there that long list. That Paul just kind of, oh yeah, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, shipwrecked and beaten with rods and stoned and, and a night and a day in the deep and and, 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 and perils of my countrymen, and perils of hunger and thirst and nakedness. And, oh, yeah, all kind of good stuff. Part of being saved. 
not ashamed of the tribulation of the saints. Hold your head up. Here's what Jesus said. Servant's not greater than his master. I was reading this afternoon. He said, if they called me Beelzebub, what do you think they're going to say about you? That's what Jesus said. He said, they call me Beelzebub. They told Jesus he was the devil. And he was perfect. Never said or did anything wrong. What do you reckon they're going to say about us? Philippians 1.29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. <laughs> kind of a package deal. Preacher, I, I, I didn't know when I got saved I was going to have to suffer. Uh, that's because you didn't ask. Right. It's in there plain as day. Number three. Look at what he said in chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly divine, the word of truth, write this down. I'm not ashamed of the toiling in the scripture. Come on. Amen. I want to say tonight, I am not ashamed of the hours I've spent studying the scripture. Yes, sir. If anything, I'm ashamed of the time that I've wasted not studying. The scripture. I started reminiscing this afternoon. God wants every child of God to know the Bible. Let's make that crystal clear. I've hammered on that last couple of weeks, and we've got this discipleship ministry underway, and I'm just thrilled. I am thrilled that this discipleship ministry is underway. We're going into week four. Going into week four, sitting down, going through the Word of God, just some basic key principles. And just having a blast doing it. But can I tell you something? God wants every born again, blood bought child of God to know this Bible right here. He doesn't want you dependent on somebody else to tell you what he said. He gave you his word so you could read it and learn it and study it for yourself. By the way, if you're going to know this Bible, it's going to require study. That's why it says study to show thyself approved unto God. You don't study to show yourself approved to your pastor or to your church family or to try to impress your co-workers or your family. You study to show yourself approved unto God. And it's going to require study. And I know studying is not fun. In fact, Solomon said, the wisest man ever lived in Ecclesiastes 12, 12, much study is a weirdness of the flesh. In fact, in our text, the Bible uses the word workman. Do you see that? We think about workmen. We think about digging ditches or splitting firewood. He was talking about studying. He called it work. See, we've gotten so... As a society, we've gotten so lazy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's no shortcut learning the scripture. Right. You still got to study it. Amen. It's still work. By the way, the nuggets and the truths are in there. You've got to know you've got to extract them. It's like, it's like mining. Yeah. You got to mine. You got to drill down. Amen. It ain't all laying right on the surface. Right. You can read a passage of scripture. If you read it real fast, you won't get anything out of it. But you slow down and read it forwards and backwards about 15 times and just meditate on it and chew on it all day and look up those words and that verse that was dry as cracker juice when you first read it, all of a sudden now you get bogged down in there and you'll be there for two weeks. That's right. <laughs> and with gold in them there heels. Right. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir, buddy. Somebody said something to me the other day. They said, preacher, I said, I, I've been reading this. I can't get past this chapter. I said, if God's still feeding you out of it, stay in that chapter. Stay there until you tap it out. Amen. It's work. If you study, you won't be ashamed. You'll be ashamed if you don't. When your wife comes to you and says, Honey, I'm reading this verse over here. What's this mean? And you go, I don't have no idea. And that's like your default always answer. We're not talking about, she's not over in 2 Chronicles. Talking about what's his face, but get what's his face. I mean, we're over here in the Gospels, and it's supposed to be something simple, and you're like, I don't know. 
and your kids come to you and say, we heard this verse in Bible class, and Brother Leader dealt with this in Sunday school, and I heard this in chapel, and what's this talking about? And you go, I don't know. After a while, that ought to get embarrassing. By the way, in Luke 19, 13, we're told to occupy till he comes. That word occupy means to be stewarding and busy about the Father's business. Stay with me now. I'm building the case here. Right. Occupy till he comes. Jesus, as a 12-year-old in, 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 in Luke 2, his parents, his mama and, and Joseph, remember they left him, and they came back three days later. You know where they found him? In the temple. Now here's what, here's what Jesus said. Listen carefully. Jesus said, wish you not that I must be about my father's business. What was he doing? He was asking questions. <laughs> he wasn't starting churches. Come on now. Tell me you ain't never seen that before. I'm busy about the father's business. He wasn't soul winning. He wasn't starting churches. You know what he was doing? He was sitting at the feet of the doctors hearing them and asking them questions. And you know what he was saying to his mother Mary? I'm preparing to be involved in the father's business, which is going to require a basic knowledge, stay with me, of the father's business. Right. Learning the ropes. See, we can't occupy. We can't be busy about the father's business if we don't know what's going on. What does he want? What does he expect? What does he want us to do? Well, we're going to have to study. <laughs> you, you, you feel that in there right now? That's how, that's how it is in school when teachers says, and your homework assignment for this week is, and they're like, oh, I don't want to play Xbox for six straight hours. I don't want to do homework. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what he says. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You're going to have to know a lot about, stay with me, you're going to have to know a lot about the Bible to interpret it correctly. Amen. Amen. You can't just know the books of the Bible. You can't just learn the Romans road. You can't just learn who the 12 disciples are by name and say, I got this, I'm ready to go. No, you can't rightly divide until you know it. Well, you won't know it until you study it. And he says, if you study it, you won't be ashamed. Which tells me, if you don't study, you're going to be ashamed. He says, I don't want you to be ashamed. Study. Learn the Bible. Take the time. Find out what God said. He was good enough to give it to us. He was good enough to reveal it to us. He was good enough to preserve it. He was good enough to pass it down. The least we can do is familiarize ourselves with it. On a personal note, I started studying the Bible seriously when I was about 12. That's when I got a hunger and a desire to know the Bible. It was about 12 when it clicked for me that there was a whole lot more in there than what just met the eye. My parents were missionaries in the Samoan Islands down in the South Pacific. We were 11. I was 11 when I got there. I was 13, 13 and a half, I think, when we left. And I remember... I had the opportunity to lead the first Samoan to Christ in the, in, the, in, the, in the laundromat two weeks after we got there. His name was uh, Vili, Vili Robertson. Vili Robertson got saved in the laundromat, came to our house, make a long story short, and my daddy started discipling him one-on-one, -on -one, just like we're doing here on Wednesday night, one-on-one -on -one, right there at the table. Daddy started, daddy started discipling him, and I sat there. I had a personal interest in, in Vili's growth because... He was my convert. And we had a concrete slab outside of our house. And you could hear those flip-flops coming across that concrete slab at night. They didn't tell you they was coming. They'd just show up with their Bible and a notebook. They want a Bible lesson. They didn't stop what he was doing and spend a couple hours in the Word. And then one day, Billy showed up, and he had a friend with him. He brought a friend. I'm trying to remember the, the, the order of names. He brought, he brought Lameki. Then he brought, brought Ma'a. 
He started, before it was over with, there were six or seven, six or eight Samoan young men sitting around that table. Three, four, five nights a week, discipleship. And more often than not, I sat right there with them. And Daddy just go through the Bible and explain concepts and truths. And as a 12-year-old boy, I got a hunger and a desire to know the Bible. And then old Lingifo Yeti got called to preach. That was Vili's cousin. The new first convert, Vili's cousin, Lingi. His name's Lingifo Yeti. We called him Lingi <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> Lingi, his wife Eileen, they got saved. And one night they were sitting around the table having a class about the church, the doctrine of the church which y'all going to be getting here in just a week or two. Is that this week? Lesson four, the church. And I remember they were sitting around the table, and Daddy was explaining to them. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And a church in the Greek is the word ekklesia. It means a called out group of people, assembly of people, serving God together, fulfilling the Great Commission together. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. I think it was Lingy. Somebody looked around, one of them said, said well, when... Why don't we have a church? Daddy's like, well, that's just kind of what I've been waiting on somebody to ask me. That's what we came over here to do was to start a church. We started a church right there in our home. And not too long after that, Lingy said, why can't we have it at our house? We're just having church at their house. And he got called to preach. God called him to preach. He come over every night and Daddy taught him and grounded him in the word of God. And I sit at that table more often than not when Lingy was preparing for the ministry. As a 13-year-old boy, I learned everything he learned. I'll never forget when Daddy ordained him, laid hands on him, and the church voted him as the pastor. And we left Samoa and left that little church there with that national pastor. I thought to myself, I know everything Lingy knows. And he's a pastor now. And it made me want to learn. Mormons would show up at our house and Daddy would sit on the front porch and talk to them. And all the other kids were out in the yard playing. I was sitting right there listening to Daddy witnessing the Mormons. Now you want to have fun. <laughs> you want to have fun. Go in circles with a bunch of Mormons. Missionaries from Salt Lake City, Utah with a little black name badge and the bicycle and everything. But I learned to witness to Mormons when I was 13 years old. We came home from the mission field. I remember I was 15 when we were living in South Carolina, living in Georgia. Mom and Daddy was gone one day, and two Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on the door. They don't call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's what they were. Russellites, followers of Charles Taz Russell, with their watchtowers and their little satchels. I remember they came to the door, and they started talking. And if I'd have been the average 15-year-old, I'd have said, Mom, Daddy's not here. And I'd have shut the door on them, but I was ready to talk to them. I'd done learned to talk to them. I was waiting to talk to them. And bless their heart, I felt sorry for them. They didn't know what they was in for. <laughs> I'd turn them every which way but loose. I'll never forget, I'll never forget standing on that front porch talking to those two Jehovah's Witnesses missionaries when I was 15. And I said, do you believe Jesus is God? And they said, no, he was a God, small g God, but he was not God. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Over the book of Isaiah, when it says, for unto you a, a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who is that talking about? And watch them swallow their tongue. Take them over to the book of Hebrews chapter number one where God said unto the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Take them over to Titus chapter number two where it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's that talking about? And they just look at you and they just blink. And they say, you know what, we got to go. We got to go. And I remember talking to Daddy about it when they got home. I said, man, Daddy, I said, I had them so fouled up. They didn't know if they was coming or going. Used nothing but Bible. I'll never forget, Brother Bittner, those two Jehovah's Witnesses came back that night about 7 o'clock, knocked on the door. 
My daddy went to the door and they said, can we, they said, can I help you? They said, we just want to let you know that we thoroughly disagree with your theology, but we've got to commend you on the way you trained your son because he knows his Bible. We've got to give him that. Fifteen years old. And then he said, well, what was he wrong about? <laughs> like round two, here we go. I learned to witness to Baha'is and Buddhists. Deal with people in Catholicism that didn't understand that we don't have to pray to Mary. We don't have to pray to Mary. Mary had to get saved just like we do. And explain to them that Jesus is the, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And take the Bible and help people find answers. That got in me as a teenager. And I'm not going to lie to you, I still today have a hard time understanding somebody not being interested in the Bible. It's a mystery to me. How they could be interested in anything and everything, but the Bible, they, they could take it or leave it. You ought to be ashamed. In fact, the Bible says if you don't study to show yourself, you are going to be ashamed. Let me close with this. One of the qualifications of the pastor is that he be apt to teach. You know it would be nice if every church member was apt to learn. Wouldn't that make a nice combination? Now, if you've got a pastor that's apt to teach, I would advise you to be apt to learn. I couldn't get over how many times the Apostle Paul, look at what he says, in, I'm still in 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at what he says in verse number 11, wherefore I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. He talked about being a teacher over and over and over again. He talked about teaching. He talked in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy chapter number 1. He talked about these people that tried to be teachers, but they neither understood what they say nor whereof they affirm in verse number 7. Paul said, Timothy, I want you to be a teacher, but you're going to have to know it and understand it before you can teach it. Mamas and daddies, if you're going to be a spiritual leader in your family, you're going to know your Bible. Husband, if you're going to be the spiritual leader in your home, you're going to have to know your Bible. Otherwise, you're going to be ashamed. I'm not talking about if you just got saved five minutes ago. There have people been saved five, ten years. I know I've been on this, I've been kicking this hobby horse for a while. But I want to say tonight, if you'll study your Bible and labor and toil and study and be a workman, you won't have anything to be ashamed of. Now, you won't ever understand it all. <laughs> You will never understand it all. I don't even use the term Bible scholars anymore. The word scholar means a master of a subject. I call them Bible students. I think Brother Sammy helped me with that, Brother Sasser. He called them Bible students because you never master it all. But you can get a good understanding of the Word of God to the point to where you're not embarrassed. I wonder tonight, are you ashamed? Or can you say like the Apostle Paul, not ashamed? Let me close with Philippians 1.20. Listen to this verse, Philippians 1.20. Paul said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. I wonder tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if there'd be anybody that would just quietly right now get up from their seat and get in this altar. Maybe God spoke to your heart on that first point about being ashamed of the testimony of Christ. Maybe God spoke to your heart on that second point about being ashamed of suffering as a Christian. Or maybe God spoke to your heart on that third point about maybe spending a little bit more time and effort studying Learning what the Bible says. Jesus said this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, if we got to live by every word, we need to learn every word. We need to know it. We got baptism. We got somebody getting baptized. You got plenty of time to pray. Plenty of time to pray.
God doesn't want us to be ashamed. It greatly inhibits our boldness, our confidence.